Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. First, I want to thank God for allowing us to hopefully... Um, use our story to positively affect everybody. I would like to thank um, Pastor Rob and the members of Bethany for allowing us to come before you today. And I'd like to thank um, all our friends and loved ones and everybody who came out to support us. So um, a dear friend of mine, his name is Sean. We work together and we do different Bible studies together. And during those Bible studies, he said, hey, have you tried to look at the message version of the Bible? So, you know, you could change it to a new international, different things. So I was in preparing what I was going to say this morning. I was like, okay, we're talking about forgiveness and reconciliation. So I did what, I'm not sure if pastors do it. I did what I did. And I'm like, let me just put forgiveness in the Bible app and see what comes up and see which scripture I feel like fits me or fits our message the best. So in doing that, I was reading them, I was like, yeah, they're okay, but I'm not really sure. So I changed it to the message version. I was like, oh, this works a little bit better. So the message version of Matthew 6, 14 to 15 says, in prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Um, and then... Um, the, I guess, scholar in me said, let me actually Google what forgiveness or reconciliation means. So if you actually Google forgiveness and reconciliation, it says to forgive or to reconcile. I'm like, that really doesn't help because it kind of uses the word in a definition. So I looked up forgive. And forgive, Marion Webster defines as to cease to feel resentment against an offender. And it's another one, but I thought that one was the most relevant for our conversation today. And then I looked up the rec reconcile, and it says, it had a number of them, but number three, it says to cause to submit or accept something unpleasant, which I think is also the best for this message. So I just want to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Joellen Jones. Um, I'm born and raised in the Cumberland County area, and Roughly, tw almost 22 years ago, my brother was killed. Um, I was, at the time, 18 years old. My brother was 19 years old, and it was four days after Christmas. Um, when I say my brother and I were best friends, we were best friends. We were only 14 months apart, so we grew up together. I can't remember. He was older than me, so obviously I can't remember a time that I didn't know him, and I'm sure he probably would have said the same thing. He probably doesn't remember those 14, 14 months without a sister. Um, so 
when we were about seven or eight, we had made this promise to each other that we will always have each other's back. So back in 1998, I was a senior in high school. He had just graduated, and we had all these plans on what we were going to do to become an adult. Because adulthood, when you're in high school, seems like the dopest thing in the world. Like, it seems like so cool. Like, I'm going to be an adult. I can do what I want to do. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. You know what I mean? We were excited about this. We were going to go to college, and we were going to get our own place, and we were going to travel. I had no idea how we were funding any of these ideals, but that was what we were going to do. We were going to take over the world. And um, in my senior year of high school, I actually worked three jobs. I don't know why I worked three jobs, but I worked three jobs. I worked at a bank. I worked at a um, children's place, and I worked at the movie theater. And I will work certain days, cer certain times, but Wednesday night, I didn't work. That was my day off. And I used to get paid from the bank every Wednesday night. So my brother and I decided that on Wednesday nights, we would have date night. I paid, and we would go out. And we normally went to Red Lobster. So every Wednesday night, we would go to Red Lobster, and we would talk about what we were doing and what our plans were for the future. And that was our time kind of to reconnect and talk and spend time together. So um, like I said, he was, he was working. He was working at Thompson's uh, Motor Parts. Now, it's not, it doesn't even exist anymore, but it was right down the street on Pearl Street. And Wednesday night, we would go out to eat, and we would spend time together. And, and that was just m the moment for me and him, because normally it was me, him, our cousins, our friends, and other people. But this was our time to connect. Well, on December 29th, um, it was a normal, a normal day. I got up and went to work. He went, got up and did what he wanted to do. And that night we were going with our friends to the Cold Classics. Um, by the end of the night, my brother had passed away. He had died of gunshot wounds. And although that night is why I'm here today, it's more about what happened after that point. And like I said, up to that point, we were normal teenagers with normal goals and normal things that we wanted to do in life. And that one defining moment changed my life forever. And at some points, I can say it changed my life for the worse. Um, I saw some of my lowest periods of time right after my brother's death. But it's something that it caused me to put a lot of mirrors in front of my face. And before I go on with my story, I want to introduce you to Ryan. Come on. Ryan and I, um, and just to give you a heads up, he's a little bit nervous. I'm used to kind of talking to people. And he's like, hey, <laughs> I'm not sure how this is going to go. And I said, well, I'll kind of ask you a question, and you kind of can answer it. And then <laughs> I'll take over and got to go back for it. So I just want Ryan to tell you a little bit about himself up until December 29th, what he was doing, where he was at in his life, and a little bit about his experiences. How you doing, Ryan Young? Uh, 98, I was 18. I left away for uh, college. I was actually playing football upstate New York. Uh, came home for Christmas break, never even packed my stuff. Went around, ran out some friends and everything, moving around, being young. Uh, my mom passed me when I was leaving. She told me to slow down. I was like, I'll be back. Kept moving. Uh, that was the last time I saw her free. Then uh, ended up the Colt Classic game and things happened. I didn't know her brother, didn't know the people there really. And the situation occurred that night. And then uh, from there I was, uh, was in prison. I was in prison from there. Uh, saw the same people that was with me uh, disappear other than my family. Uh, watched my kids grow up from behind bars. Uh, you know, kind of uh, realized like life, kind of grew up in there and it took years before you finally start realizing stuff. In the beginning you're still angry at the world and everything, thinking about uh, everybody's against you and everything. Then you start growing like, a, you know, maybe I was supposed to sit down. I mean, that's what I believe. I believe I was supposed to sit down. Uh, I stayed, of course, I stayed in the law library. It wasn't that I wasn't, uh, it wasn't I wasn't owning up for what I did, but it was just uh, the way the system did. There was a lot of things that wasn't right in my, in my case that they did. Like I said, not saying that what I did was right, but I mean, it just wasn't what the system was supposed to do. And uh, I think over time, it just took me to realize, like, uh, I think I needed to sit down. I think it was, uh, he was going to let me go when he felt like he was ready for me to go. 
and I, uh, you know, I believe I believe that happened. I mean, I believe that happened in there. Uh, I see my mom pass while I was in there, probably like 17 months before I finally got home when they finally lowered my sentence. Like 17 months into going home, she passed away. Um, and then I came home, and I think maybe like a, oh, maybe like a year, maybe like a year, I ran into uh, Joelle and didn't know her, didn't recognize her face or anything. She spoke to me at Applebee's. And then uh, she was speaking to my parole officer about meeting up and everything. We spoke. We did a couple of uh, couple of meetings. Me and her mom, Joelle, and uh, I think that's where we're coming from now. I think we're getting here now because of the meetings. I think. And, uh, I'll let you go ahead and jump back in because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan is being, and I can't say nice, um, but being very good about it because it wasn't. A situation where he went away and they came home and we talked about him. We fought against him. We petitioned the court not to lower his bail. My mom got over a thousand signatures. We went to court in full force every day wanting him to be punished. Wanting him to be responsible or take responsibility. And to be honest, I didn't care about Ryan, I didn't care about his mother, I didn't care about his children. I was angry. And I don't like that, we always say don't use the word hate, but I had hate for this man because he took something from me and I didn't understand why. Right, he took those Wednesday night dinners and he took away those plans that we had for the future and we didn't know why and I was angry and I spent a good time being angry and a good time being mad and a good time being hurt and um, so I'm an attorney now and I've always wanted to be an attorney but even during that period of time I kind of pushed that job that ideal to the side I decided that I don't want to be a part of a system that to me just did not work for anybody. And that obviously that desire to become an attorney came back and even when it came back I decided I wanted to be a defense attorney and more specifically a public defender. And I wanted to give a voice to people who normally didn't have voices. And as I became a parent and I graduated from law school and I just started defending people in Ryan's situation. And I wondered why is nobody showing my clients any humanity? Why isn't anybody showing them any compassion? And I think back and thought, I didn't show this man any compassion or this man any humanity. I'm asking people to do something that I didn't want to do. And then Ryan says, I came up to him at Applebee's and I've shared this with him before, but what I said to him was not what I was supposed to say. So Ryan spent about 16 years, 15. 15, about 15 years incarcerated. So for 15 years, I had these conversations with myself. When I see this guy, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna do this, and it's gonna be this, and it's gonna be that. And I even talked to God like that. I told God, like, God, when we see him, it's, it's on sight. Like, we gonna do this, I'm gonna take my earrings off, and I'm gonna, like, I had a plan, right? So I knew what I was gonna do when I saw him. And the first time I saw him, it wasn't the second time I spoke to him. The first time I didn't speak to him, I was going into Genesis nursing home and I was walking with my daughter and I stopped in my tracks and this person walked past me. And my daughter looked at me and she said, mom, who was that man? And I looked at her and I was like, that's the man who killed your uncle. And even after that, I had my mind, if I see him again, <laughs> this is what I'm gonna say and what I'm gonna do. And when I saw him at Applebee's, I was with my daughter and her best friend for her, her daughter's best friend birthday. It was in May. And I walked up to him and I was like, it's the moment. And I remember my daughter, I heard my daughter's, her friend's mom say, who's that? And RJ said, that's the guy who killed my uncle. And she took her head. And I think everybody didn't know what I was going to say. So I walked up to him and the words that came out of my mouth were, do you know who I am? And I told him who I was. And the next word says, I would like to work with you. And I stopped myself in my tracks because I was like, these are not the words I've been planning for 15 years. Like, I had, I had a plan. Like, this is not the plan. So I have no idea. And I remember telling God, like, God, like, no. Remember when I said I was going to say this and I said I was going to do this? And God, I guess, was like, no, 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 no. I got another plan for you. I have other words that she would say. 
And the reason was, like I said, at that point, I had become a defense attorney. But I had watched so many other young people throw their lives away. I had watched so many other families right in my community bury loved ones. And I'm like, it has to stop. And although I reached out to his parole officer, it wasn't easy. Like, there was a lot of pushback because we weren't supposed to talk. I wasn't supposed to hear his story. I was supposed to stay the angry family of the defendant because it, it fit everybody's narrative. It's easy for us not to look at Ryan as a human being or a person to make him a villain because then we don't have to deal with all the other things that are going on. So we actually, there still was a disconnect, and um, we kind of reached out to this parole officer, but I kept getting backlash, and then Ryan was released from parole, and he inboxed me, and was like, do you still want to talk? Like, do you still want to meet up? So we met up, I think, a little over a year ago. Yeah. About a little over a year ago, we met up at, um, we went to Glassboro, because we tried to find a neutral location, and we met in Glassboro, and it was me, him, and my mom. And... Me and mom were sitting there waiting for him to come. I was like, do you think he's going to come? And then it was like, I don't know if he's going to show up. Um, so I just want him to talk a little bit about what your experience was meeting up with us for that first time or talking to us or the fact that we wanted to talk to you. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I was surprised when I seen him. Like, I didn't know what to think. Like, have somebody actually forgive me? Like, when, they, you know, she lost her son, she lost her brother. And then forgiving the person that's responsible was like uh, I think I was kind of like standoffish at first, wasn't, couldn't believe it was real, or was there something behind this, or, and then just to see that it was genuine, I think that's, that's the thing that got me the most, like it was genuine, it was like, I mean, how, how can you say no when somebody's forgiving you for something like that? Because I think that kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's kind of touched me, like, you know, I seen that she even hugged me, uh, told me, uh, I know you lost your mother, I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you ever need a motherly love, a motherly hug, you can call me anytime and talk to me anytime. And she still texts me now, texts me now, asks how I'm going and everything. Um, texts me uh, when I lost my niece. Texts me when my fiance lost her uh, grandfather. She, she's, she's been, been genuine. Like I think in the beginning it was like, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. It was like, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to believe somebody could forgive you for for doing something like that. I, th I mean, it just uh, that was. <laughs> Go ahead, take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get, get used to it. Yeah, get used to it. Um, yeah. And I've told Ryan that I thank him for allowing us to have that conversation. You know, I have so many people who will say to me, how can you? Or why did you? Or I have family members who don't understand. And what I say to a lot of them is that I needed this. I didn't even know I needed it, right? I didn't know I needed to talk to Ryan. But God apparently did, because like I said, he changed my words. Um, so he know I needed this. I think he knows our community needs this. Um, it's, it's one of those things that you can't change, right? So if I break something of yours, I can replace it or I can repair it. You know, death's final. You know, there is no coming back to that. And the fact that one moment, two strangers, people who didn't know each other before that point, were forever connected, right? In a, in a moment's time, and something that was a tragedy and like I said for me it was hard there was days I didn't want to get out of the bed there was days after my brother died that I I would go to sleep and I would wake up and not that I wanted to commit suicide I would say God why am I still here I even remember my grandmother when they first told her about my brother passing uh, a local pastor came over and said I'm gonna pray with you and my grandmother looked at him and was like I've been praying my whole life and my grandson's still dead and the thing is, is that I wasn't just mad at Ryan. I was mad at my brother for dying. I was mad at God for allowing it to happen. I was angry for a lot of times. And then, like I said, I went through life and I became a parent. And I started 
the line of defense work. And it just was those things inside of me when I sat down and I talked with my clients and some have been charged with horrific things and some maybe simpler stuff. And you go to somebody and say, hey, this person made a mistake, but we need to show them some type of compassion. And that the world just wants to see that mistake. You're not ever allowed to be anything but that moment in your life. And then I start thinking about my own life and thinking about, thank God when I get before him, prayfully, at least in my mind, he's not going to just hone on on that one moment, that one mistake that time, the one bad word I said to somebody, or the one time I hurt somebody's feelings, or, or the, the, the mistakes in my life, that I'm not being judged just solely on those mistakes and on those moments. And then that was the thing about Ryan. I don't want him judged on the, that mistake, on that moment. Because let me tell you something, me hating him is never going to bring my brother back. So I could spend a, but what it was doing, it was weighing me down. It was causing me pain and anguish that I didn't realize it was. And it's funny because Ryan and I talk on a fairly regular basis about everything. Right, like not just about us speak, having speaking engagements. I was excited about getting a deal on a pocketbook, and I was like, "Yo, I know you probably gonna be excited because I'm excited about it." He, he probably could care less about me getting a pocketbook, but to me, it was like, "Hey, guess what I did?" And we talk on a regular basis, and I'm thankful that he allowed us to forgive him. Right, that he allowed us to have a conversation. I know it's not easy, and when I, we talk about coming out and speaking in groups and even about speaking today, it's very careful because I actually have become protective of him. Like, I'm not going to let anybody bash him or make him out to be a villain as we stand here together. It's my job, almost in a sense, to protect him. And then the, the thing about it is why I tell people is like, what happened? On December 29th of 1998, it happened. It was a mistake. But me or anybody else hating him, that's intentional. That's different. To me, that's a different level of wrong, right? He didn't purposely hate me, do anything to harm me. He wasn't purposely out there trying to change my life. But if I was to do something to him, I purposely did that. I purposely disregarded his fiance. I purposely disregarded his children. And that's a different type of thing. So I think that as human beings, we have to realize even in the worst of circumstances, we make mistakes. We all go out through our days and things happen, but everybody deserves to be forgave for their mistakes. And nobody should have to spend a lifetime being punished for those. I think about some of the things that he's been through, like losing his mother while being incarcerated. I can't imagine losing my mom now, but definitely not why I'm behind bars. I think about when he shares with me how after a while, the crowds start to die, around, die down. And that doesn't just happen with him, it happens with the families of the loved ones. When you have a, my brother's funeral, there was standing room only. For a month or two, we had people at our house every night calling. But eventually, people go about their lives. They may remember him on his birthday or on a holiday, but they go about their lives. And my family, me and my mom, don't do that. I've had people say to me, we don't come to your house because we, we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to accept it. But the problem is I have to accept it every day. Every graduation, every birthday, every big event, everything, I have to deal with it every day. Every day, Ryan, right before we were going to speak, somebody wrote something on Facebook and Ryan sent me the message and they were referring to him. And I was so angry about that because I was thinking, how dare you want to attack this man 22 years later? Because in the last 22 years, you weren't really spending your time honoring my brother's legacy. You weren't spending your time giving my mom a phone call, but you had the nerve to want to attack him. And then I was afraid because I was like, this is nothing but the devil. 
because I think they're trying to discourage him from telling his story or standing with me on Sunday. And I was like, Lord, please don't let this defeat him. Don't let this break down everything that we have worked so hard to get to this point. Like I said, forgiveness is not easy. I don't want to stand before you all and say, like I said, it's almost been 22 years. I don't want to get stand before you all and say this happened overnight or that you can do this because it's not as easy to have. But I think that we as a society need, need to design a system or options so they can happen earlier. My mother actually spoke to his mother about? Uh, probably about 2000, uh, in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s. My mom did it before May. Yeah, she went to our house. My mom did it before May. And my mom's just been completely amazing through all of this, and even with her relationship with Ryan. It's funny, because sometimes she'll text me and say, do you talk to him? I was like, yeah, we talk. She's like, because I'm not sure. Like, he doesn't text me or he doesn't call me. <laughs> and, I, and I'll say, I'll tell him, like she said, that she want to talk to you too. <laughs> like she feels, she's feeling left out <laughs> of um, this, this, this forgiveness process. But it's something that I needed. It's something that God knew I needed. It's something that I don't know if Ryan knew I needed this. <laughs> Um, and I think it's, there's room for it in our system as we have designed now. Is room for it in a lot of things. And for us it's been, uh, it's kind of been, we talk and then it's kind of weird because you don't want to ask too many questions and you want to ask not enough questions. But I think we got where we're kind of very open and honest with each other at this point. Um, so, I'll let you say something. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> um, just the process for you. Oh, uh, well, being locked up, me yeah. as far as the. Or whatever. You um, I think everybody looks at you as uh, you, they look at the stick, the stigma of the whole charge, and not as a person until they realize uh, what type of person you are, who you really are, and realize how old you were at the time when something happened. Um, like I remember one time, um, I got a job, I got my CDL, started driving, and. Um, Remember, a parole officer, I used to have to text him when I leave the state. And I used to text him every day and make a delivery to such and such or Virginia or such and such. And they have these like way stations. And you had to pull in. You don't actually deal with an officer, but you deal like it's an officer inside of there that you got to go there and sit. I had to go in there one day, uh, turn my, uh, take my license and everything, gives a ticket, but the ticket goes to the job. Parole officer calls me around, uh, I don't know, it has to be like 10 something at night. He was, just, he was just like screaming about me having police contact, not telling them. Uh, Talking about violating me. I did nothing wrong. You saw my violating me and everything. So I never actually told my job. At that time, I was working at a foundry for uh, Matt Miller. And uh, I never told him what my charge was. I was worried about if I would be able to get a job because of the charge and everything. But it was either like go back or tell him. So I told him. Uh, he was like, I've never thought. And he asked me about the situation. I told him everything. He was like, Have your parole officer come here. The parole officer came there, talked to the parole officer. He was like, Look, Ryan didn't, uh, Ryan didn't do anything wrong. The ticket comes to us. The parole officer, his, story, his, his attitude changed just from talking to him. The same thing I told him was the same thing he was telling him, but it, made, it held more weight coming from him. It was, like, was kind of like you're, you're, you, know, you don't count. You're, you're like, uh, whatever you say isn't true because of your charge. And then ever since then, I had no problem with him over that. Like, but it was just the, the way they look at you because of the charge. Like, people don't take you, uh, you know, your word isn't too much to people. Uh, you know, they kind of look down on you, I think. So you, I mean, you're kind of hesitant to let people know your charge because of the way people look at you and everything. Because you know, people don't actually get the time to get to know you as a person. Then they get to know you as a person, and they find out later on it's like, oh, I don't believe it. Like I mean, but you know, you would have never took the chance to know me if I'd have told you from the beginning. Like, you know, yeah. you, know you go back. Yeah, you know, I'm out. I got these <laughs> Come in it out. Um, I think just that. As people of God, as Christians, we have to take more time. Like, I don't know if you heard him earlier when he said his mom told him to slow down. I think that message is so powerful in anything that we do. That day, his mom told him to slow down. And I think we all have to learn to slow down. 
We're so quick to have our preconceived ideals or notions about who someone is, no matter what. And that goes among so many things, right? You're a certain person because you're a prosecutor or you're a defense attorney, or you're a doctor, or you're an investigator, or you're a teenager, um, you're a pastor. We have these preconceived ideals of who people are, and we're not willing to just slow down and really get a chance to know them and open ourselves up to that. And I think one of the reasons for me was in not being angry at him, I had to put a beer before my face. And I had to sit and think about who I was as a person. Like I said, I had to look at my errors and the times I have done someone wrong. I had to look at just accepting the fact that um, if I believe in God, like we say we do, and I believe he is powerful, he makes no mistakes, and that from the time we're thought of into the time we leave this earth, he has those days numbered for us. If I believe in those things, that although how my brother died was sad, he lived his time here on the earth that he was supposed to live. And I will say this, just to tell you a little bit, my brother, he lived those days. Like he wasn't a person, he lived life, he did things with his friends, he probably lived more in his 19 years than most of us do given more time here on this planet. And when I stop and think that, if I focus just on his death, I forget to think about his life. I forget to think about all the times we played as kids and all the great things that we did together. So this process of forgiveness has helped us, has helped me look at things differently, has made me to me even a better attorney as I stop back and listen to my clients a little bit more and hear their stories a little bit more and hopefully are able to articulate those stories in a way that benefits them. Um, this is just the beginning for us, and like I said, we're thankful for the opportunity to come and speak in what we consider a safe place, because it's definitely hard, because you don't know how you're going to be received. Like, and I hate to say it's like, it's probably easier for me, not just because I'm used to speaking, but because my family is considered the victims in this situation. So it's easier. So I'm very grateful for Ryan for coming forward. And while we're sitting here earlier, I said, guess what I did? I, <laughs> I put our names in to speak to this event in Alabama. <laughs> on, on my, so like, I don't know if we're going to get accepted, but hey, guess what? <laughs> Road trip. So, so um, I thank him for the opportunity. I thank the pastor for the opportunity. Um, for coming and being able to share just a part of our message, a part of our story with you all this morning. I thank God for hopefully using us in a way that hopefully we can positively affect our community, that we can talk to young people about the real and raw of what it looks like. So many times people get the opportunity to hear a story of a victim's family and maybe somebody who's formerly incarcerated, but hopefully our story together, us standing here together with the hopes of wanting more for our community will get everybody thinking about what can I do. Maybe we will change just one person's minds that not when you just not see we see Ryan but when you see somebody similarly situated to Ryan that you will think differently about who he is he's a good guy he really is he's a good guy with a good heart and an amazing family and I thank God I was telling his fiance to earlier like she's a good person like she's 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 a strong person and her her daughter is a strong person and um, her story of forgiveness. It isn't just in with us, her story of forgiveness, my mother's, my daughter's, other people that were affected by it. Um, so we just thank you all for the opportunity to share with you briefly this morning. Continue to pray for us as we expand and continue to work on this journey and hopefully be able to share a message that just changed the minds of what people are thinking. So thank you. Let's all pray together.
Father, we thank you so much for the words that we have heard. But Father, we thank you for the spirit that has been shown to us. We thank you that you have modeled forgiveness for us by sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. We thank you for the examples of forgiveness in our midst. And Father, we recognize that all of us bear some sort of unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts. May we be active participants in not only in our own healing, but in the healing and restoration of others and in this community, recognizing that blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.